Susan Birch today is going to be talking about the case of Junius Wilson, and I'll let her unpack the historical context, details, and import of that case uh, for you much better than I could, of course. Uh, but I want to say a couple things about why this is important. Within the field of disability studies and in the related areas of psychology, psychiatry, and social work in this case, the problem of forcible or coercive psychiatric institutionalization and criminal um, or psychiatric institutionalization in forensic context, meaning in the cases of criminal cases or trials, is already a really understudied area. There's too little that we don't fully understand about the experiences, narratives, context, identities, and, um, and life histories and, and context for people who have been forcibly institutionalized. Um, and that's true even without sort of complicating the whole social, racial, cultural, or economic picture for individuals, which we often need to do, and without fully unpacking the gender politics involved in coercive institutionalization. Right? We don't know enough about what it means to be forced into a psychiatric hospital. But we particularly know very little about what that history involves for people who are very racially vulnerable. Right? We know only a little bit about the fact that this phenomenon is even at issue, much less understanding how does race play a substantial role in bringing about coercive institutionalization, and what are the experiences of individual people of color who are in that position. So in and of itself, that makes this talk important and unique. But this talk also deals with the way in which people with disabilities and people who are deaf are understood and read and misread in legal contexts, in cases and courts and trials. And so the interaction between psychiatry and law is really at issue in this talk. And I just want to say how vital and unique this is. I actually can't think of another speaker who's taking up this kind of case study or history or another scholar period. Um, so it really is tremendously exciting to have Susan Birch join us because the fact that this is an understudied and under-acknowledged issue does not mean it's not urgent or more widespread than people would imagine, both in U.S. history and to some extent in contemporary contexts. So we're really looking forward to hearing what Dr. Birch can say about this in policy and practice. And I won't overdo um, setting up my excitement about her visit because I think it can get a little overwhelming for speakers when you uh, pile on the praise. <laughs> um, but I do need to say, just in talking with Susan over the past year and planning for this talk, how immediately excited I was that she was the speaker who was going to become coming to do justice to this vital topic. Um, we really wanted this speaker series to capture some of the ways in which the interaction between race and gender and disability create very complex vulnerabilities about which there's a great deal that often gets missed. And what was amazing about talking to Susan was as soon as I said that what was what she wanted to do, that that was what we wanted to do, her, enth her enthusiasm was infectious. She was practically overjoyed at the prospect of being able to speak meaningfully about this subject and had the uh, enviable problem of having too many things she wanted to say, too many subjects she wanted to speak about all of which really engaged really powerfully with that Im imperative. So it was amazing to not just say, you know, do you think that you can bring this kind of analysis to bear, but to have to say, which one of the several things that I could do that with uh, should we prioritize today? Um, I can't tell you what uh, an impressive and wonderful thing it is to work with someone in disability studies who has such a strong <coughs> consciousness. Though not entirely unique, it's still a bit too rare. And so it was really um, with that appreciation that I, I welcome Susan Birch to UCLA. Um, I mentioned, though, that I also want to introduce our discussant today. We're uh, joined by Dr. Ben Lewis, uh, who is, um, I would say, known and repeated at UCLA as something of a treasure if that's not too objectifying. Um, one of the things that I hear about Ben uh, from my students in disability studies is that he's pretty much the best professor ever. And even though, I have, um, even though I have a typical faculty ego, I'm not even the least bit jealous because 
uh, it's so clear that he's <laughs> because it's so clear that he's just really uniquely committed to a thorough and engaged and generous and thoughtful educational process. The fact that he is currently, sadly, UCLA's only deaf faculty member, um, I just want to acknowledge, can't be um, anything other than a challenging position to be in. So we're all really grateful that he's chosen to continue continue rising to that challenge and on top of that to take out the time to join us today for this really important talk. Um, the fact that on top of that he is an intellect to be reckoned with um, and that's clear both from his writing and from his teaching makes it all the more helpful to have Ben's expertise and knowledge as he comments on the crucial subject of a deaf African-American man, Junius Wilson, who was institutionalized essentially from for his entire life since uh, essentially adolescence. So I really want to, again, thank both Susan Birch and Ben Lewis and, of course, the UCLA Program in Disability Studies, including its intrepid faculty and staff, particularly Kyle McJunkin and Brooke Wilkinson and Ivy Abuen. Um, and with no further ado, I want to invite you to help me in welcoming Susan Birch. Getting to come to UCLA is a singular honor. To be among colleagues whose work has nourished my own and to meet new friends and to see old friends here is a gift indeed. I thank you all, including the co-sponsors, for enabling this to happen. All historical scholarship is a practice in interdependence. We learn each other's knowledge and wisdom and we use that to generate new knowledge and hopefully wisdom. I would be remiss if I did not start my remarks by acknowledging and particularly thanking the brilliant Dr. Hannah Joyner, my dear friend and colleague, the co-author of the biography of Junius Wilson, and to whom I owe a debt I couldn't possibly replace. I also want to acknowledge John Wasson, who you will learn about in my remarks, and to especially recognize the late Helen Hinn and Everett Parker, as well as relatives of Mr. Wilson. I couldn't have done any of this without the assistance of archivists, of activists, of colleagues and friends. There are too many to name individually, but I thank you for your help. <clears throat> I hope to foster as well as consider inclusion and accessibility today, so I really want to invite all of you authentically, stand up, move around, stretch, knit as you need to, and do what you need to do in order to take care of yourselves including leaving the room for as long as you need to, if you need to. I have one copy of a large print version of the script of my remarks today that I'd be happy to send out if someone in the audience would like it. There are also digital versions of um, the talk today that would be happy to share with you, recognizing that many of us benefit from accessing information at a different place and a different pace and that environmental barriers are among the many factors that impact our ways of learning. Would anyone like a copy? Would you pass it back? Thank you. So before I jump into the broader story, there's a term I'm going to be invoking a lot, and I want to make sure that it's one that's understandable. I'm going to be showing how this term is entangled, interdependent with other forces. That term is called ableism. How many people here are familiar with the term ableism? Looking around the room, most of the folks, yay, UCLA. <laughs> As I'm using ableism, what I mean is a system of power and privilege that discriminates against people who are or are perceived as being disabled. It privileges those who are or are perceived as not disabled. It involves pervasive ideas, institutions, and social relations. Within ableism is a specific form of discrimination, a system, a force, if you will, called autism. And that involves discrimination against deaf people, or those perceived to be deaf. And it privileges those who are not deaf, or are perceived as not deaf. So as Beth generously described my work, I'm anchored in history. And so I'd like to begin by remembering. <clears throat> 
historians remember. We remember. And by that, I mean we keep in mind for attention or consideration. We commemorate. We mention favorably. We recapture the past. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, remembering also means, and I'm quoting now, to recollect, to think about, reflect on, to recall the memory of a person or a thing with some kind of feeling or intention, to record, to mention. To remember, at least since the mid-19th century, also has meant, and this is really important, to put together again, to reverse the dismembering of something. So I'd like to suggest that studying the historical overlaps of race, disability, and gender matters. It matters not only for recording the past, but for repopulating it with people who have inhabited what I often call the locked wards of the past. And in so doing, I hope to serve partly to preserve and counter the dismembering of the past. So today, I'm going to share with you the life story of Mr. Junius Wilson, an African-American deaf man from North Carolina. I hope to honor the individual and his experiences recording and remembering this past. Why focus on just one person, you may wonder? Narrowing the lens and focus on individuals and the context in which they created their lives rewards us with stories that are complicated, are personal, diverse, embodied, shifting, and interactive. Admittedly, individual life stories do not necessarily represent broad populations or experiences, but microhistory and biography gives us the chance to ask large questions in small places. The intense study of the particular offers assets not available in broader historical and theoretical analysis. The unique qualities of an individual story makes very real the way independent forces shape lives. So I want to draw your attention to the slide that's on the screen at the moment. It's a black and white uh, photograph from the 1990s, and it shows Mr. Junius Wilson seated in a wheelchair. He's about to enter a cottage. He's holding a baseball cap in his hand. He's wearing another on his head. He's wearing a jacket with tie, and a white man is partially shown pushing the chair behind him. This is Mr. Junius Wilson. Like many lived experience, this lived one by Mr. Wilson carries lessons that I believe are relevant for us today, whether or not history is your passion or profession. And among the lessons I hope you'll take from our time together are these. Identity is dynamic. Categories like race and gender and disability and death constantly shape, inflect, complicate and amplify the resonance of one another, changing their meanings in different times and different places. Wilson's human story also calls us to today to consider how our own ethical engagement and responsibilities in our work and in our lives. Junius Wilson's lived experiences, while unique, are not singular. I'm going to say that again. While they are unique, they are not singular, nor are they relevant only to a distant past. Across the 20th and into the 21st century, systemic racism and ableism remain central features of the American story. Legacies of Jim Crow and eugenics, as well as of forced institutionalizations, carry powerful meanings into concepts and work in mental health, education, policy, community care, and social justice. We are all the inheritors of this complicated legacy, even as we experience this legacy in different ways. I'm especially going to spotlight language in this story, and by that I mean communicating, ways of communicating, and the words that are used. So to begin with Mr. Wilson's story, this is Junius Wilson. The slide is another black and white photo of Mr. Wilson from the late 1990s. He's standing in this picture, looking off to his right side. He's wearing a baseball cap, a striped Oxford shirt, a bit of a wistful look on his face. Mr. Wilson was born in October 1908 in rural Castlehane, North Carolina, 
His parents were Mary and Sidney Wilson. Now I want you to think back to the early 1900s, the late 1800s. This is a period of racial segregation in the US that was particularly strong, in fact virulent, throughout the South and across the United States. But in Wilmington, which was the major town nearby, in 1898, so just one decade before Mr. Wilson was born, this was the site of one of the worst race massacres since the Civil War. The picture that I'm now showing you is from Wilmington in 1898. It, it illustrates a mass of white men, some of them holding rifles and other weapons, standing in front of a wood building that has been mostly burned to the ground. A small group of white men stand on the second floor of this burned out building. This was taken from that race massacre. We don't know exactly when or how Mr. Wilson became deaf, but at age seven, he was moved in 1916 to the residential school for the deaf, the Raleigh School for the Colored, Deaf, and Dumb, and Blind. This is a photo of one of the main buildings of that school. Uh, it's three-storied and brick with two symmetrical wings and a low <coughs> iron fence flanking it. In this photo, there are no people uh, present. As with all other Southern institutions, this was a racially segregated school, but Jim Crow had specific meaning here. For several decades, this school provided space for deaf people and signing non-deaf meaning hearing, but I mean specifically non-deaf relatives, of different races and ethnicities who served as teachers. The adult children of Chang and Ng Bunker, who were called the original Siamese twins, um, taught at this institution, and all of them had graduated from the white deaf school. The Tillinghast brothers, David and Thomas, were master signers and leaders in the white deaf cultural world. They taught at this school. Two black deaf teachers, Thomas Flowers and Blanche Williams, were graduates of Northern Residential Schools for the Deaf, and they joined the faculty here in the 1890s, and they stayed for almost two decades. While white, te while white teachers were not racial role models, and almost certainly brought at least some of the racial hierarchy of the time, these interracial experiences had the potential to provide some students with skills to challenge Jim Crow. This cultural family of deaf adults also modeled gendered and to varying degrees socioeconomic class norms for the children. An example would be that in the vocational training program, boys were taught farming and shoe repair by male faculty. Girls received training from women in sewing and home economics. For various reasons, however, by World War I, all of the deaf teachers had left this school. The white deaf school had been reestablished across the state in Morganton. And that means that the black deaf children in Raleigh had few deaf adult role models or a consistent mean to transmit a codified sign language. Physical isolation from both the white deaf schools and other black deaf schools meant that Raleigh's students created signed communication that was truly accessible only to their immediate community. The children primarily crafted and transmitted this signed communication. So let's take a moment and think about this. It's a reversal of roles. The children taught sign language to their non-deaf teachers at this school. And this dialect, which has been called black signs, doesn't actually capture the linguistic complexity of the situation. While American Sign Language, ASL, how many people in the room know ASL, just out of curiosity? Not many yet. <laughs> In time, yes. <laughs> Professor Lewis is going to change that here at UCLA. So while American Sign Language, or ASL, in white deaf residential schools across the nation reveal regional differences, black signs could vary dramatically between different states' segregated schools. What does that mean? It means that Junius Wilson became part of an extremely small linguistic pocket. And unlike white deaf Americans around the nation who shared ASL, no other deaf people, black or white, outside of North Carolina would understand the sign language used at Wilson School. And of course, Raleigh signs were almost completely ineffective in communicating with non-signing, usually non-deaf people. 
Now the school gave seven-year-old Wilson both a community and a cultural identity. He became a black, deaf Carolinian. And for nearly a decade, the school served as Junius Wilson's primary home and community. He matured from a child to a young man there. And the deaf youth came to experience <coughs> deafness as, and I mean this quite specifically, normal, at least within the school walls. Through Raleigh signs, Wilson not only learned broad concepts, but playful slang and visual humor. <coughs> Think about your own moments in school spaces and all that we've learned there. He, like many deaf youngsters, learned his name for the first time, his sign name. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So in deaf cultural world, sign names are incredibly important to those of us involved in the community, and it's a sacred ritual to receive a sign name. Junius Wilson, and I invite those of you who are watching this to also share his sign name. It doesn't matter which hand you use. Clench one of your hands into a fist, then set your pinky upright, okay? And now you're gonna take that pinky towards your chest and scoop it as if you were writing the letter J into that chest. There you go. You are all using Junius Wilson's sign name. That was his name. And we'll come back to that. Merely by watching his peers, he could appreciate the value of close physical proximity and direct eye contact for easier communication. Along with his peers, Wilson embraced cultural deafness, including aspects of the culture that often made non-deaf people uneasy. Gaining attention by touching each other, waving arms widely, hollering to hard of hearing friends so they would turn their hands, heads and ears and eyes to catch ensuing signs and sounds. Students at the North Carolina school spent most of their time together, signing with one another, sharing gossip, informally educating one another. Even with limited formal educational opportunities, the pupils galvanized a common identity, a sense of belonging. In 1924, Junius Wilson's class made a trip to what was then called the Negro State Fair. And Wilson was apparently fascinated by the environment. He didn't return to the school for two days, remaining at large. For his absenteeism, he was expelled from the school and sent home. I should note that no one graduated from this school before the 1930s. But having been gone for the better part of eight years, his homecoming, unfortunately, was a disruptive influence for his family. And I want to take a moment to note how removal from the school would incur additional costs for someone like Wilson. He's not merely expelled from school. But disability discrimination, ableism, compounded Jim Crow oppression, making it difficult for the young black deaf man to find work to contribute to the family economy, to fit into his kinship community, literally to communicate with others in Castle Hain. And here is where I want to draw attention to interdependent factors, which are so vivid. Race, gender, age, disability, place, and economic status. And these are only a few of the factors at play, all informed the complex, dangerous, and vulnerable place that Wilson inhabited in the 1920s. Communication was a problem. Sign language and literary issues, literacy issues pervaded. His family did not know the signed language that he knew, and they also did not know how to read and write. They had very limited means of communicating with one another. There are economic pressures at play here Junius Wilson was unable to get a job and support himself because of ableist attitudes that he would be dangerous in the workplace, so no one would hire him. His behavior was viewed as another significant problem, staring, touching, unintelligible noises, which were interpreted by non-deaf people as animalistic, would have been completely common at the deaf school. They were viewed as completely alien in this environment tensions mounted, and likely people in Castle Hain feared that these behaviors might be misinterpreted by white bosses, more frightful by white women. Remember, the threat of violent retribution for real or perceived infractions of Jim Crow haunted black communities across this region. <coughs> 
So it's in this complicated context that a neighbor and adopted kin came to the conclusion that Junius Wilson's possible conflict with the white population could represent a genuine danger for the entire family. Ultimately, Arthur Smith took matters into his own hands to get rid of him. In 1925, Smith's apparently false accusation of Junius Wilson's attempted assault with intent to rape brought police to Castle Hain. They arrived and arrested the teenager, handcuffing him, silencing him, and removing him to the Wilmington jail. Uninformed of Wilson's hearing status, the jailer, jury, and judge, all white, non-deaf men, misinterpreted his deafness as mental incompetence, first viewing him in the language of the time as feeble-minded, and then as insane. According to the trial report, a doctor evaluating Wilson never mentioned his deafness. He assessed Wilson's inability to respond appropriately to his voiced questions and directions as indication of mental incompetence, perhaps of trickery. Emphasizing the charges that had been brought against Wilson, the prosecutor elicited from the physician <coughs> authoritative confirmation that the teenager was a danger to himself or to others. Unable, literally, to speak on his own behalf, and absent others who understood his sign of form, his sign formed of communication, Wilson, a young black man accused of an attempted violent sex crime, was read by the jury as incompetent and deviant. Consequently, they deemed him unable to stand trial in a criminal case. Instead, he was sentenced to indefinite incarceration in the criminal ward of the state hospital for the Negro insane, an institution that was later renamed Sherry Hospital. I think it bears telling that the newspaper accounts that week described Judge Daniels as especially firm with the many black criminals he assessed that week. And likely, Wilson's family never saw the few words published in the trial article that noted that their relative had been sent to Goldsboro. I think it's also worth mentioning that during the same week, and also reported in the newspapers in Wilmington, that across the state in Asheville, vigilante mobs had amassed at the courthouse in an effort to abduct and lynch two African-American men accused of raping a white woman. In Wilmington itself, Birth of a Nation, W.D. Griffith's classic racist film interpretation of Reconstruction Era America was being replayed at the local movie theater. The memory of Wilmington's 1898 race massacre was still present here. It was memorable. It was remembered. The Klan presence was strong here. On the screen are two pictures of where Junius Wilson was then sent in 1925. This is the State Hospital for the Negro Insane in Goldsboro, later known as Cherry Hospital. It shows a very tall, many-storied building made of brick. A tall <coughs> wood fence surrounds it. The image on <coughs> your right is from another angle on that campus. It had many, many acres. Again, fencing, many-storied buildings, bars. It was a desperate institution. Rodents infested the buildings. People were held in cages, and there were outbreaks of infectious diseases. The criminal insane building, 17-year-old Wilson's new home, was particularly dangerous. In the process of restraining them, staff had killed two institutionalized people in the year prior to Wilson's arrival. The isolation was particularly keen for Junius Wilson, who in essence lived in linguistic isolation for roughly seven decades. During Wilson's first few years at the hospital in the 1920s, America was becoming increasingly committed to eugenic ideals. And what I mean by eugenic ideals, I'm going to give you a, a really streamlined version. It's a really complicated thing. But eugenics means good in stock. And in the late 19th and early 20th century, eugenics was commonly understood to be a science of improving human heredity. It was believed at the time that human worth could be qualified and quantified. And that's important to keep in mind as we learn what happens next. 
By 1929, North Carolina had followed other states in enacting its first eugenic sterilization law. In 1931, the Goldsboro superintendent, W.C. Linville, surgically castrated Junius Wilson. Recall, he'd been accused of being a violent sex offender, a young black deaf man held in a psychiatric institution, a primary target for these kinds of medical violent interventions. Taking advantage of his otherwise healthy body, Linville then sent Wilson to labor on the hospital farm. And this next image shows two black and white photos of the farm at this hospital during the 1920s and 1930s. On your right are uh, women who were institutionalized at the institution who are working in the fields. Um, and to the bottom right are groups of male institutionalized people working the fields, uh, raising profits for the institution, feeding the people there, and being paid nothing. So Wilson labored on this hospital farm essentially as an indentured servant, one might say slave. He would work there uncompensated for several decades. In 1947, his younger sister Carrie and his father Sidney came to campus and tried to obtain his release. The hospital refused their request and Wilson would not see family members for almost 50 more years. Now, civil rights activism ultimately affected Wilson's life as the hospital desegregated in the mid-1960s. And with the subsequent closing of the farm, Wilson and his peers would return to the main campus. <coughs> no one, of course, explained what was happening to Mr. Wilson. They didn't share his language. We can only imagine what that experience was like for him. Over the next decade, disability civil rights activists successfully campaigned for the release of people forcibly held in psychiatric institutions. And more diverse options for treatment in this period contributed to upwards of 90% of incarcerated populations leaving the locked wards. During the 1970s and 1980s, staff doctors formally concluded that Junius Wilson was sane. Investigation by a caseworker revealed that the criminal charges had been dropped. So technically, there were no legal grounds to keep Wilson there, but they did for 20 more years. Why? Why did they keep him? According to hospital records, one of the reasons was because he was deaf. They believed he could not live independently because he was deaf. Money also factors into this. Over the years, by working odd jobs, Wilson had accumulated several thousand dollars that was kept in a hospital account. And while he himself did not have direct access to the money, its presence ironically disqualified him from the federal programs that would have supported housing for him outside the hospital had he been released. Benevolence. Staff judged him unprepared to live in the outside world and believed it would be cruel to release him. They believed it was benevolent to keep him. So they signed the forms that made Wilson an, a voluntary patient at the hospital. Their terms, voluntary patient. In the 1980s, according to hospital documents, there's greater sensitivity to Junius Wilson as a deaf person he underwent several evaluations where specialists who knew sign language suggested that the hospital accommodate him with sign language, actual sign language. This was repeatedly ignored by the hospital administration. And unfortunately, in 1986, Mr. Wilson experienced a stroke which incapacitated his right dominant signing arm. The next watershed moment came in 1990 when social worker John Wasson became the legal guardian of Mr. Wilson. And the photo that's now projected on the screen is of Mr. John Wasson, a white social worker. He's reclining in a chair in a business jacket and tie, cross legs, glasses, a mustache looking somewhat earnestly, seriously into the camera. John Wasson <coughs> opened Junius Wilson's medical files he was appalled by what he found. 
It clearly showed that the man was not insane, but merely deaf, and that the legal charges had not been pending for decades. John Wasson brought a lawsuit to release Junius Wilson from the locked wards. Of perhaps even greater importance, John Wasson found Everett Parker, a deaf African-American man who had also attended the Raleigh School, and thus knew Wilson's microcosmic sign dialect. Everett Parker was hired by the hospital and would become Junius Wilson's closest companion. These are color photos that I'm showing on the screen now, and there's two of them. On your left is a picture of Everett Parker standing next to Junius Wilson, who is seated. Wilson is wearing a red baseball cap. He's smirking just a little bit. Um, a walker is in front of him. One of his hands is up near his mouth. Um, Everett Parker is uh, dapper in dress slacks and a sweater, and he's smiling also somewhat impishly with a glimmer in his eye at the camera. In the picture to your right, Junius Wilson and Everett Parker are seated on steps, and Everett Parker is doing the universal sign for I love you, do you all recognize that sign, to the camera. He's hamming it up for the camera. You can tell that they're also leaning into one another. There's intimacy there. There's friendship there. There's understanding there. Mr. Parker and others would spend the next decade trying to re-educate Wilson in sign language and expose him to life outside the wards. The result of legal action moved Junius Wilson from the locked wards to a small cottage on the grounds of the hospital in 1994 and provided him with 24-hour care. We're back to an earlier image of Mr. Wilson standing in the bedroom of that cottage. He's in a striped shirt. It's a mirrored chest of drawers behind him. He's wearing a baseball cap looking off to the side. Staff at the hospital described him as a gentle, childlike man who spent most of his days watching television, working jigsaw puzzles, going with his caretakers to lunch at Hardee's, and entertaining friendly visitors. By most accounts, Wilson did not express <coughs> bitterness or resentment about his situation. It's unclear how much he even understood about the reasons for his incarceration at Cherry Hospital. Junius Wilson died in March 2001 at the age of 92. This is again the photo of Junius Wilson as he's about to go into the cottage for the first time in a wheelchair, holding a baseball cap in his hand, <coughs> another on his head, being pushed into the cottage by a partially shown white staff member. <coughs> On the slide, I've listed a number of topics that I'd like to talk about with you now. Identities and social forces as complex and interdependent. Interpretation, language, and labels. <coughs> Self-reflection as a sustained process. Considerations of power and privilege. And remembering. As Wilson's story, I think, clearly demonstrates, we cannot merely separate out one aspect of identity in total isolation from the other parts without seriously undermining the full force and meaning of Wilson's life experience. And this, of course, applies more broadly to our work in higher education, healthcare, policy, social work, which is to say, in our work and our lives in the broader world. As an historian, I think a lot about sources and artifacts, the raw ingredients of the past. Information created by the hospital during Wilson's long incarceration largely charted a story that increasingly deviated from Wilson's actual past. Slivers of his family history, names, letters, addresses, and efforts to gain his discharge were lost under new pages of the incarcerated man's medical files. Staff regularly created their own explanations for Wilson's presence at that psychiatric institution. One nurse uh, interpreted unanswered hospital letters to relatives that had been sent in the 1970s as proof that they were unable or unwilling to take him back. Others assumed he had no family at all. This is untrue. These and other interpretations of Mr. Wilson and his family haunt me and I don't mean to personally vilify the generations of social workers, 
healthcare technicians, doctors, or others whose work intersected with Mr. Wilson's life. But I do want to draw our attention to the broader systems of power and privilege, including racism and ableism, and how these forces enabled, indeed propelled, the oppressive context and violent interventions Mr. Wilson experienced across his lifetime. Attending to our own ethical engagements and responsibility calls for rigorous self-reflection <coughs> and hard work. And this, in turn, involves reinterpreting and re-remembering. What does that mean? To varying degrees, we're all interpreters. We fill in gaps of knowledge using the knowledge we've already acquired. In this process, we are the filters and the producers of knowledge. And this process of interpreting has significant ramifications. What's not included? What is included? Who's not included? Who is included? As Hannah Joyner and I began learning into the life story of Mr. Wilson, we were challenged to reinterpret and re-remember our own learned ideas, how we did historical work, how we taught it, how we considered our broader engagements with communities. As just an illustrating example, in our beloved field of disability history and deaf history, disability historians commonly isolate or narrowly consider the combination of social forces and identity factors. Sometimes we miss the important role of context in our own internalized assumptions and or our positions of power and privilege, although I'm gratified to note that that's changing. What do I mean by that? I mean the tendency to hold race in one corner and gender in another place of the house, of class and age and national origins and documentation status elsewhere as if we aren't all of these things at once. Since many people here have backgrounds in other disciplines, I'm hoping that you also can share your perspectives, your theories, your ideas that help us in this pursuit. Hannah and I are also deaf historians. We study cultural deaf histories, and I think Wilson's story complicates the traditional way that that story has been told. It's usually cast as white elite deaf members, and yet in this instance, Junius Wilson used a different form of sign language than American sign language. His social status, his options, his resources, profoundly different than the stories typically told in deaf cultural studies. His tragic story complicates the conventional view also of the racial caste system known as Jim Crow. And scholars of Southern history have shown us the ways that race unified small communities like Castle Hain in the face of crushing oppression. But here again, disability and death undermines racial ties and leads to Wilson's expulsion from his family. What I mean to say is ableism and autism contributes to his very vulnerable place. Junius Wilson's lived experiences complicate institutional and eugenics history, which tend to be told by administrators or those who hold similar views from those who are actually held on the inside. Wilson's story asks us to reconsider how and why America sought to categorize and control populations deemed different from the mainstream or the ideal. And I want to return to that key point I mentioned at the outset about interdependent identity factors and social forces. Re-remembering. Remembering Mr. Wilson's life draws attention to the ways that being deaf, how gender, race, and age, among other critical factors, all matter all the time, even if certain dimensions may appear or to take on greater salience. The big picture context shows this as well as the small moments, from the country's historical foundations in slavery to the era of Jim Crow, and within it the creation of racially segregated deaf schools and psychiatric institutions, to popular culture representations of black savages and whiteness as noble and normal. The forces of anti-black racism and ableism shaped Junius Wilson's options and how others interpreted him across his entire lifetime. He was viewed as incompetent, his deaf behaviors as aberrant, as threatening, as inherently defective, as helpless, across his whole life. Some examples of that. In the 1990s, many people in and around Cherry Hospital 
in and around the town of Goldsboro knew a great deal about Mr. Wilson, including the fact that he had been surgically castrated. That was public knowledge in Goldsboro. He was commonly described as an old black man, an elderly black man, childlike, without threat or authority, asexual. And that's important. Staff shared with me during interviews stories that they thought were quite funny of baseball caps, which Mr. Wilson loved dearly, and one that said red hot lover with lightning bolts on it. And they thought it was particularly funny that someone had given Junius Wilson a hat that said red hot lover, because how could he have any identity as a lover at all? These interpretations of Wilson also shifted across his lifetime as he aged, as those observing him also held changing views. Early in his life, he was likely seen more or less as a child, less harmful, perhaps even an object of some charity, perhaps seen as a person with some potential. As a teenager, he was viewed quite specifically as threatening. When he was elderly, again, he was viewed as childlike, dependent, with no sexual identity, a victim. And of course, in all of this, language is a hinge. In history, we tend to attend to language not just as an issue of understanding and communication, but it's important for us to think about how other people understand language. So I want to draw our attention to labels and judgments of Junius Wilson and language, and from there to his identity. And here I want to be really clear, I'm not conflating the use of a signed language, or even American Sign Language, with a deaf cultural identity. There are many people who use signed languages and American Sign Language who may not be culturally deaf, and we can talk about that more later if that would be useful. <coughs> but in the medical files, one doctor called Junius Wilson signs, and I'm quoting now, elegant hand language, while many staff referred to them, and I'm quoting, crude gestures. Did this difference affect their assessment of his intellect and potential? How did it shape his treatment? In very practical ways, language disconnections fundamentally shaped Junius Wilson's daily life. Repeatedly, he had to educate the others around him in how to communicate with him. And in a context where staff and others usually had limited time and interest. So being moved to different wards, which happened across his adult life frequently, meant having to re-educate those around him in how to even communicate with him. And of course, when he was told he was being moved, that would not have been offered in a language that was accessible to him. Now, some staff claimed to understand Junius Wilson completely. And when pressed, they admitted that they had never actually had full conversations with him. But simple smiles and homemade gestures, such as thumbs up, or rubbing the stomach, meaning hunger or a good meal, represented, and I'm quoting, complete understanding. One staff member in the 1970s apparently created a sign that was meant to mean work time, time to go to work. And I'm going to show you this sign. It looks something like this, and I'm going to describe it and invite you to replicate it. So make this with both hands, and now put your pointer finger straight up. Okay? Good, you look beautiful. And now I want you to take one hand, it doesn't matter which one, and point it kind of forward, okay? So that the top of your hand is, is facing up, good. And now take the other one and bring it down on top of that pointer finger of the other hand. Good, you're signing it. Do you see each other signing it? That's what it looked like. This sign, which the staff member... Could, could you explain what that means? Yeah, I'm about... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Lewis knows exactly where this is going. So this sign, which was meant to convey it's time to go to work, meant can't, cannot, can't, cannot. That's what it means in American Sign Language. It's what it meant in Raleigh signs as well. Time to go to work, time to go to work, can't, cannot. Because staff did not necessarily understand Wilson's communication style, they did not understand his view of the world. This means that non-signing staff cannot tell us much about the feelings and ideas that Wilson experienced or expressed. 
and the impact of state-sponsored removals and the impact of labels applied to Mr. Wilson stays with me to this day. I want to draw attention to the impact of the many removals from his original home in Castle Hain to the school, from the school back to Castle Hain, from Castle Hain to Wilmington Jail, from jail to the Goldsboro Psychiatric Institution. These incurred losses more profound than most. He was removed from his kin who knew him, from his cultural kin at that deaf school who could communicate with him. In essence, he lost the cultural and social capital to sustain him. And his later removals to and within the hospital, from the criminal insane ward to farm, and then to different locked wards, including the geriatric ward, maps a shifting status, images of menacing savage to inmate and patient, to community member, to charitable ward, to victimized American citizen. These changing labels for Wilson reflect external cultural beliefs, shaped by time, place, and readings of his aging, raced, classed, deaf, and disabled body. And such markers were always dynamic, shaped in part by those so labeled. In this case, as in many others, our access to how Wilson understood any of this remains frustratingly elusive. It's a dismembering, a disremembering that haunts us. Admittedly, Janius Wilson's story is unique in many ways, but it is in no way singular. From the common anecdotes of deaf people institutionalized with diagnoses of cognitive or psychological disabilities because of language barriers, to the generations of deaf people, particularly those of color or from marginally, econo marginally economically marginalized communities, and that of course often overlaps, who are expelled early from residential schools, forced removals have played a consistent and complicated role in the evolution of deaf cultural communities. I'm gonna give you a really recent example, and by recent, I mean 2014. Abraham Zemadegehu, who is an Ethiopian American deaf man, this past <coughs> February, was arrested at National Airport in Washington, D.C., the same city where Gallaudet University, the only institution of higher education specifically devoted to deaf and hard of hearing students, Washington, D.C., and where many national deaf organizations are headquartered. <coughs> he had been trying to find a warm place for the night. Police believed that he had stolen an iPad. Through writing and signs, Mr. Zemadegehu asserted that he needed an American Sign Language interpreter. He was held for six weeks at the jail in linguistic isolation. He had no idea why he had been incarcerated, why medical procedures were being done on him, or what rights he had in this institution. He was finally released after accepting a plea deal about receiving a stolen iPad, but I want to note that later revelations showed that the iPad's owner found the lost device. Mm -hmm. My point is this. Our good intentions are not sufficient. Our desire to imagine the past as fully separate from the present limits our capacity to undertake the rigorous self-reflection and cross-cultural learning that is vital to create a more inclusive and just world. This is a demanding and a rewarding gift, a continuous process of learning and applying our knowledge. And we all have a role to play in it. Think about the various pivotal moments in Mr. Wilson's life, how differently that path might have gone, how differently our own paths as a broader community could have been, how they can be. It invites us to return to remembering. It's particularly important that we not remove from our collective history people who have been removed to or from institutions. I'm showing on the screen that earlier photo of Mr. Wilson in the wheelchair wearing a baseball cap entering the cottage in the 1990s. Junius Wilson and countless other institutionalized men, women, and children continued to have lives 
and there is much to learn from their individual and collective histories. As scholar C. Richard King has described it, people like Wilson and other institutionalized people were, quote, diagnosed, categorized, compared and evaluated with reference to dominant psychological and cultural norms. And across this experience, they were understood not merely as pupils or students, inmates or wards, but as specifically identifiable people, strongly marked by medicalized, racialized, gendered, classed, ableist, and age-based understandings. Wilson and others clearly dealt with oppression and struggle, but their stories also reveal a spectrum of human interaction, including dynamic, complicated, shifting self-definitions and changing roles in community. As Junius Wilson's story teaches us, I think, the importance of acknowledging our own learned cultural beliefs and practices of the messy and sometimes dissonant relationship between our intentions, our highest aspirations of inclusion, of justice, of well-being, and the actual impact of our actions. I hope that our time today will be well remembered. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Lewis to share his thoughts. Well, I want to sit down. I don't know. Is it, can I sit down? Okay. Really, everything about that presentation remind me of things that I, the things that we really take for granted. Often, we forget about linguistics and people's language and just human rights. Without that language, then we have to have that language or we don't have all our human rights. Often with American Sign Language, like she was saying with black ASL, uh, another thing that's complicated about that is that I don't know black ASL. I'm deaf, but I don't know that. Sometimes people think that it's maybe lesser of a language, but it's not. It's really just important that we can respect each other's and not think that maybe mine is linguistically better, just like often people think English is linguistically better than ASL. It's like with immigrants, when they move to America, maybe they're speaking a different language. They could be so intelligent, but if they're not speaking English, often we say, oh, they're not very smart. That's not an educated person. Automatically, we jump to this conclusion, when really, we don't have a chance to know their language. If they had a translator, an interpreter there with them, maybe we would see, oh my goodness, that person is so smart, but we don't realize it. And often we see, just like with this story, and that was such a great representation of people who are victims, and really they're just completely innocent, but his whole life, this person's whole life, decades long, was just taken away from him. And for nothing, they said he was uh, in there for a crime, and he's there for 70, 80 years, and that's just one person. It's unbelievable how many other people there are that we aren't hearing their stories, and we have to stop doing that. We have to make sure that history does not happen again. I could say more, but I think just for me, that's just something I wanted to throw out there. And it's really important that we look to the future and our future leaders and think about these things and what we need to do and learn here and look at your guys' career and what you can do in the future. Thank you. Questions, reflections, your feedback? What do you think? Yes, please. Um, I remember you said that it has no resource in, of how Wilson moved his own life in um, being incarcerated. Um, so did he have any um, translators in the future after he was released and then um, told any other people about his life in there? So the question is about language and what we understand or think we understand about Mr. Wilson's own understanding of his situation and whether he had access to interpreters to facilitate that communication exchange. Um, in the 1990s, there were teams of sign language experts and interpreters brought in to work with Mr. Wilson.
But I want to point out that seven decades essentially in linguistic isolation had its toll on Mr. Wilson. And among the complexities here is that most of the interpreters who were brought in to work with Mr. Wilson were trained in American Sign Language, incredibly gifted in this beautiful, distinct, authentic language, not the same language that Mr. Wilson used. And so there were already complexities of which language is going to be used and for whom and to what end. Um, Mr. Wilson spent a fair amount of time with Everett Parker and other members of the black deaf community in North Carolina, clearly enjoyed their company. Um, but the level of exchange of communication even there was already somewhat limited. And that impacts how we even understand this whole story because we don't know from Mr. Wilson how he experienced his life. An example that I find really poignant is that a, a group of interpreters were working with Mr. Wilson and he kept signing this and I'm going to show it and then describe it. So if you take one hand and kind of do flat with your palm parallel to the ground and you put it near your nose and then you dip it down kind of like an S curve, he kept signing that when they were asking him, how did you end up here? And he kept signing this and signing this. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense for an interpreter in a context where you've asked someone, how did you end up institutionalized in a psychiatric institution? That's not a sign that would seem likely. And what we think we know, and I want to emphasize think we know about this or think we understand, is that later Mr. Wilson was describing being a student at the Raleigh School and going to that fair and being excited at the fair, so many things happening and being really fascinated. And we suspect that he saw an elephant at the fair and was transfixed by the elephant. Imagine if you've never seen an elephant before, how amazing that would be. And so Junius Wilson, when asked, how did you end up here? And here is Cherry Hospital. He answered, elephant. And our interpretation of that is that he thought he was forcibly institutionalized because he played hooky from school and stayed at the state fair for two days. That's a terrifying lesson about the importance of language and access to communication and interpretation and judgment. Other questions or thoughts on this story, things that you want to add to the conversation? Yes, please. Um, the presentation is called Race, Disability, Gender in the Long Range of History, and I know you directly discussed race and disability, maybe indirectly gender a little bit, but there's probably a lot to be said for it. I was just wondering if you could touch on gender. Absolutely, thank you. So the title of the talk highlighted and foregrounded race and death and disability and gender, and it's an invitation to talk more about gender. Thank you. <laughs> and I invite others who are here also to add to that, that conversation. For me, it's interwoven into all of these judgments of Junius Wilson, that when he was a child, being viewed by other people as a young, black, deaf boy, and here boy is the pivot, the access where gender comes into play, but is always interwoven with these other aspects of identity and social forces. He was viewed as somebody, I think, he was viewed as somebody who could do something potentially into the future. He could be a contributing member of society within the confines of Jim Crow, so the racial caste system of the United States at that time. And so an expectation that he do is tied in part to black masculinity. And as a young black male, he would have been expected to learn skills to contribute. Now those skill levels would have been deemed certainly by white people as very restricted, but he was allowed and sent to the deaf school to learn some skills, to be a contributing young black deaf man. When he comes back to Castle Hayne, the fact that he's a teenager, and now he's a young black man, not child, his sexualized identity or the imaginations of him as a deeply sexual being who is physically stronger now, adult or at the threshold of being an adult, takes on all kinds of new meaning. No longer charitable, no longer full of potential, 
He is viewed especially by white people as dangerous. And because of Jim Crow racism, of white privilege and white supremacy, black people, understandably, were also deeply afraid of the possible violence that would come in their direction. That's how racism, anti-black racism, worked in this context. And being male, he was especially <coughs> viewed as threatening and dangerous. And that's partly why, in the context of eugenics and the institution, the superintendent advocated for him to be surgically castrated, so literally to emasculate him, to change his hormonal status so that he would not be seen as threatening in any way. So by changing his perceived sexual identity, by changing his sexual organs, they changed his status. And then he was viewed in that context as less threatening, but healthy and male so he could work. And as a otherwise healthy black male was required to work for free for this institution, also part of a longer <coughs> history of the United States. And as an elderly deaf black man later was viewed not quite as charitable, object of charity, but certainly as not threatening in increasing ways. And so the idea is at each moment I want to emphasize that white institutions of power reinforce their power through these tellings of Mr. Wilson, right? At each point it's white institutions of power that would take care of Mr. Wilson at each part of his life. Does that help a little bit in terms of highlighting gender? Thank you. Do other people have things they want to add about that? Or anything. Or anything, yeah, please. Jackie. I said, thank you for a wonderful talk. I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about um, how you and Hannah kind of came to the story. And then also just what are some challenges that you can also share about writing a biography as a way to move the narrative? And what can or what have you both learned and what can you share with us? Thank you. This is a happy surprise to have a Middlebury friend present here. Um, I, I would say the universe was kind is how I learned about Genius Plus, and they were kind to me. <laughs> Um, I was working at Gallaudet University in the 1990s, and I was working on my dissertation. I was interested in deaf cultural histories, and as I mentioned before, I have a concern about a single telling of deaf cultural worlds that tend to privilege white people with college educations, people who are specifically educated at my beloved Gallaudet University. And so I was actively looking for other stories. And in the archives at Gallaudet, which has the largest collection of materials about deaf people and issues related to deaf people, I found a really um, thin file about black deaf people in America. And the thinness of that file was already pretty striking. And when I opened it, one of the documents inside was a photocopy of a newspaper article from the 1990s that John Wasson had enabled Happen. In other words, he had called a newspaper reporter in the 1990s to bring attention to Mr. Wilson's situation in the hopes of compelling the governor of North Carolina to honor the request and the agreement that Mr. Wilson would leave the locked wards. Savvy, savvy strategy. And as I was reading this newspaper account, I was bowled over. Um, it was a learning that my white privilege had shielded me from. And so I started uh, circling my photocopy of that copy and looking for all the names of the people I could find in that story. And I was so, so fortunate because I was able to get a hold of John Wasson. And John Wasson had studied <coughs> history as an undergraduate. And he's a social justice advocate. And so when I talked about my interest and why I wanted to know more about the story, he opened up his address book. And he started introducing me to other people in the story. And this was before Mr. Wilson had passed on. I never met Mr. Wilson in person, but because John Wasson opened that address book, and because Helen Hinn, who is the guardian of Mr. Wilson's estate after he passed, she granted us permission to access all of these materials. And these kinds of materials are often utterly um, inaccessible to scholars. They're often utterly inaccessible to relatives. Um, but that unique and generous act by Helen Hinn and John Wasson and then other people who knew Mr. Wilson opened a whole new world for me. And it has changed the entire path of my life from the people who are dear in my world to how I understand history 
hopefully how I teach and the kind of questions that I want to ask. I'm a nice white lady from New England. I teach um, now at a, a wonderful elite liberal arts college. And when I taught at Gallaudet, it's an institution of higher learning. I move with so much privilege in the world, even as a person who also has a disability and other disadvantages because of systems of power and privilege. The abundant privileges that swirl in my world um, enabled all sorts of things to be possible with this research and also created complications. I interviewed many staff members. I interviewed relatives of Mr. Wilson's. I interviewed many people who had attended that Raleigh School for the Black Deaf. <coughs> and I am not of those worlds. And owning that and working on that, and I can't pretend like I have that figured out. This is life work. Um, and hopefully I, I become at least a little more wise in the process. But I'm mostly dependent on the generosity of others as I stumble in it. But thinking about who am I in a moment interviewing people who have lived these worlds, for whom this story is family history, for whom this story is local community history, is an invitation for humility and self-reflection that I, I hope to, to continue to practice. I invite others to think, too, about who we are in different moments. I've been lucky enough to use American Sign Language for most of my life, and that enabled me to meet other people who likely would not have been part of this story if I hadn't been able to communicate with them directly. And so thinking about the vital importance of language by right? everyone, if you can, study all the languages that you can. Take American Sign Language classes at UCLA. Take all the language classes that you can. It opens worlds. It opens understanding, and we need more of that. I, I went and found a New York Times article from 94 when he was released. You probably read it. And there's a sentence here. One historian said, Mis Mr. Wilson's plight is a vestige of a bygone era. So I just wanted to thank you for your take, which is a bit different from this, uh, sort of bringing much more into the presence and realizing that we can't um, have this opinion. Um, so that, that was one comment. You can say something about it if you want. I also had a question, though, which was um, from your talk earlier this afternoon about the Canton uh, mm -hmm. as uh, Asylum. Mm -hmm. You were, you were speaking of dislocation and relocation, and now here today there's a lot of dismembering and remembering. And I, I wondered if those terms sort of talk to each other in the way you work and what they say about how we do history. Thank you. What a generous reflection and question. So the reflection, and this is the cool thing of 2015 where we can pull up on the internet um, the articles uh, that, that are available in the world, which is to say he, he found one of the articles from the 1990s that I got to read from back in the day, and the storytelling that frequently suggests that the past is fully past, oh, that was then. Mm -hmm. And many staff members in the late 1990s and early 2000s when I was interviewing them, and, and this is not to pick on staff members, this is a representation of many people, would say, what happened to Mr. Wilson in the 1920s was awful, but now it's okay. We care about him or we cared about him, and it's all good now. And I can appreciate the seductiveness of that story. And I want to challenge us to resist it, because it's not true. And when I think about the danger of a single story, which I spoke about earlier today, the brilliant framing um, by novelist Chimamanda Adichie, is that when we follow a single story, we miss the actual, complicated, important, and lived ways that people have been in the world. We flatten human experience, and we limit ourselves in the process of it, as well as limit our understanding of other people. I began learning about Mr. Wilson's story, what feels like centuries ago now, um, and it's his story that I credit with leading me to learning into the story of people incarcerated at the Canton Asylum for Insane Indians, which was the only federal psychiatric institution created for Native people in the United States, and that was open from 1902 to 1934. And having relatives of people who were held there, including <coughs> individuals who are present for this talk today, and for whom that is a gift beyond words, I can say that when we think about human impact, at least for me, it changes everything. 
It's one thing to look at sources in archives and to see words from the past. It's another thing to create scholarly works and imagine having expansive impact if we're so lucky. And it grounds us and challenges us to be very thoughtful, intentional when we think about the impact of these works, when relatives of the people that I'm learning about and writing about, the story I'm telling and the power that I have in getting to tell that, and to realize that this is family story for some people. This is the story of friends and loved ones, of ancestors, of people whose life is intimately woven into theirs. Again, I think it invites us to move perhaps with a, a dose of humility and self-reflection in the ways that what we do matters. Our impact can be quite wide, and it can have really unexpected results. Thank you for the question and the summary. Any other reflections, questions? Yes, please. So I also appreciate <coughs> the um, emphasis on the fact that this, these are not historically isolated or um, segmented phenomena, meaning there's an ongoing dialogue between past and present and a way in which the dynamics of the 1920s fed into and sustained continuing harmful dynamics later. Um, and I appreciated the fact that you brought up a 2014 example of the fact that none of these has shifted. I also um, think that I heard somewhat explicitly and certainly implicitly in your talk a number of ways in which you were inviting people who are generally in positions of power and certainly practitioners to be mindful of certain things. I'm wondering if I can push to distill those a little farther, sort of like what are key principles or takeaways that you would say, for instance, never underestimate the importance of language, uh, be self-reflexive. Uh, can you tell me more about what you would want practitioners to take to heart in order to not essentially replicate the harmful actions of their predecessors in the Junius Wilson case? Thank you. Or better yet, to uh, embody the sort of advocacy that John Lawson did so effectively as a social worker. Thank you. I'm going to actually open this back to colleagues who also work in this realm, because I'm not the only person with wisdom in this room. And, and I really would love to invite your ideas on this, too. I'll start that conversation, OK? Um, and suggest that, that, at least for me, this is ongoing work. It's not that one book or article or workshop is going to answer the call. It's life work. And the gift of that is that, hopefully, we have more options and more understandings as we spend more time asking these kinds of questions and thinking about what these lessons can teach us um, and our ethical obligations to it. So I guess I would first start by saying any opportunity you can have to learn about stories that are very different from the ones you have lived is a wonderful invitation to be stretched. Any opportunity to be in active learning environments and working environments that are quite different than the ones that you've been in to date are wonderful invitations to stretch. Um, and in thinking about literally the nitty gritty, what words are we using when any of us are using words? There's a difference between calling Junius Wilson a patient at Cherry Hospital versus calling him an inmate at Cherry Hospital versus calling him a person incarcerated at an institution. And I don't mean to get kind of abstract about that. I mean, it matters how we talk about people. It matters when sources put labels onto individuals and their descendants read those labels decades later. These words carry, they carry their own stories and they attach to people and they have material ramifications. I don't mean to suggest we should now feel silenced and not use the words that we have. But when we think about literally, what are the words that come to mind? What are the words that we pull when we're talking about people other than those immediately familiar to us? And what would happen if someone else was using comparable language about us or the people that we love and are dear to us? And invite us to keep stretching and to go out onto that skinny branch and to be vulnerable in that learning. Because part of the learning is about practicing failure. I feel all the time in my work. I'm so grateful to the people who are patient with me and who continue to challenge me and uplift me 
to get back out on the skinny branch and to keep trying new concepts and new words and to stay really uncomfortable in the learning. It's important work. Can I ask back to you if you have ideas that you'd like to also share out or other people would like to share out? Sure, um, and I'll certainly be happy to defer to other folks in the room. I do think we have some good expertise here. Um, but this story highlighted a few things for me. One, to understand how just toxic and dangerous it can be when someone is um, already racially vulnerable and then uh, is barred from the communication on any linguistic basis, right? It might just be the vulnerability of an immigrant who isn't fluent in the language of the country in question. It might be a disability or deafness-based communication barrier. Um, but to really understand that when there are already a set of tropes set up to make you seem as dangerous and unworthy of rights, how strongly that's going to limit the likelihood that the right to communication will be respected. That's already a precarious and fragile right. right? So when you're already seen as unworthy and criminal, the likelihood that that's going to kick into play is really um, deeply at risk. And so for social workers and case managers, I would say, um, always thinking about what communication needs do my vulnerable clients have. And there are obvious instances where that's in play in terms of um, first language of origin or disability-based communication needs. Um, but it can also be true in terms of even just interpreting complex systems. Like, while I think that this is vitally a story that takes place in Junius Wilson's deaf world, situated within a non-deaf and very hostile world, um, I think there are takeaways and lessons that are just very broadly true about vulnerability. What would it mean for this person to be able to speak in their own voice or to communicate in their own voice and to be understood? And to do so in a way that's informed by actually understanding the context around them. The fact that we don't know a great deal of what Junius would have wanted to say is really a horrifying reflection on all the systems that were responsible for his care. And I think that there's a great deal there for contemporary medical and social service practitioners and legal, practitioner, legal practitioners to work with. On the legal side, I think the piece that I would add is just that it's um, really urgent to understand that the right to legal representation has to be attenuated and planned relative to disability-based needs wherever they're present. Um, whether a person is deaf or anything else, um, that legal representation is just meaningless if it's inaccessible. Um, and I don't see that as one of the, having been to law school, I know that that's not one of the basic tenets that's built into anyone's, base, anyone's framework of lawyering skills. Lawyers are not trained to think how do I make these legal services accessible? Nor are they even rec trained to recognize when disability is present, right? Unless it is supposedly obvious, quote unquote. Um, in other words, um, to understand what do I begin to do when I have a deaf client, much less what do I begin to do when I have a client who is actually mentally ill, and I'm not necessarily here referencing someone like Ju Junius, whose only um, mental illness may have just been the product of how severely traumatized he was. Right, so those are the things that immediately strike me, but again, I'm glad to hear if anyone else wants to add. Thank you. Could you press oh. the B? Thank you. That's so much better. I was killing my eyes with that. Speaking of access and uh, inclusive environments, thank you for that. If I would just put a few more words in dialogue with that, when we think about where problems exist, when there are problems, and those of us who are drawn to engage with addressing what we view as problems in the world, in many aspects of this story, the framing of where the problem resided was in the individual of Junius Wilson. I would contend that the problems were not located singularly, if at all, in Junius Wilson. And that invitation alone to think about when there is conflict, when there is problem, when there's disconnect, where is the actual problem? And asking that kind of question invites us to different answers. If we assume that the problem's just in that person, whoever that person is, we're going to come up with a different conclusion. Then we ask, 
What are all the possible ways that a problem has arisen? What are all the possible ways to address that issue? Yes. Um, uh, just thank you all. Thank you, Beth, and thank you uh, uh, for this uh, uh, for this uh, wonderful experience. And I, I've been very moved. You know, I did my uh, PhD here back in 2000. And speaking of all the different identities, uh, the, the library has changed completely. Like, I can't recognize it. <laughs> but I go to the elevators, that brick wall by the elevators, and that was my ticket to to freedom, to magic, was going up in the stacks on the third floor. I think it was the third floor. And I had my little cart, um, I was, and, and I would fill it up with books. And, and I very much, uh, I miss that person. Uh, I miss that identity. It was a wonderful time of my life, so I'm very happy for all of you to be here. It's a wonderful institution. And so, Junius, any of these stories where people are deprived of that education, they're always just heartbreaking for me. And what happened to him? And I guess, since we're with practitioners and people who are training to be uh, caregiving on whatever level of expertise, or, um, is that once you need something, somehow you're not equal. And uh, that's a devastating um, thing to go through. So as soon, and, and I see it because I'm in and out of a wheelchair, and I'm more in a wheelchair now, and somehow my identity goes down several mm -hmm. steps when I'm in the wheelchair. People are very nice. It's that intention thing. They just treat me like a child. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's very disturbing when you're trying to get medical care or legal advice or any of those things. So if you could always try to think as that you are on a horizontal plane with somebody, and these mm -hmm. people are your equal. They might not be just like you. And then Eve Cate, whose work I really highly recommend, which is about what happens to the concept of being a citizen and being equal when you need things. And being needy in the world we live in, um, Jane Fonda was a really important part of my life, and physical fitness is still a really important part of my life. And I do believe that we can do all sorts of things, but if you tell me that Junius Wilson, if he just had enough gumption, would have been able to fight all that stuff, I hope you see how, how cruel that is and how, how counter um, this whole idea of American exceptionalism and individualism, how much trouble it can get into you. And you can tell you, mate, I'll just finish with it, made one really important point. If you can pay for care, if you can bring the handyman over, if you can hire somebody to help you with your house, then you're equal. But you can only do that if you're economically privileged. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you need stuff, and you will be with people who need stuff, it doesn't mean that you're not equal. Um, so that's my takeaway. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I just need to point out that that is Dr. Victoria Lewis. He's a hero of mine in disability studies, just a, a phenomenal light in our universe. Um, encourage all of you to check out her work as well. Thank you for the wisdom and the insight that we all have needs, but our needs are not always the same. And recognizing what any of us need at any given point is part of the work and how any of us have access or not to the resources to be sustainable people in the world is the task that all of us are facing. And I look forward to seeing what you do with that task. <laughs> Thank you so very much for spending time with us.